Have you ever stumbled across a crazy visual effect or piece of generative art and thought, that looks awesome, I want to program that, only to find out it's made with shaders so you gave up because shaders are way too hard to learn? Well, today's the day. I'm going to teach you the dark art of writing shader programs. Shaders are an incredibly useful thing to know and can come to the rescue in all sorts of programming scenarios from 3D lighting and effects to generative art to speeding up simulations. In this video, I'm going to teach you the basics of shaders with a focus on creating 2D art and effects using Using the fragment shader and give you a really solid foundation of knowledge so you can go forward and tackle any shader effects you've seen out in the wild. Before we get into it, this is quite a long video and covers a lot of topics, so now might be a good time to grab a cup of tea or another beverage and settle in. There are also chapters for all the different sections so you can find what you're looking for if you need to come back to it later. If at any point you want clarification on something or would like to see something explored further, just drop a comment and I'll either answer your question or make a video going into more detail. In the description, you'll find links to everything I talk about, including all the examples we'll go through in this video. The examples are written using JavaScript and P5.js, but it's only a wrapper around the shader code. The actual concepts and the shader code we write can be applied to writing shaders in other environments as well. Since the examples are in P5.js, you can follow the links in the description and edit and run the code in your browser so you don't need to spend any time getting anything set up and can follow along. With all that out of the way, what actually is a shader? At its simplest, a shader is a chunk of code that gets run on the graphics processing unit or GPU instead of on the central processing unit or CPU. Both the CPU and GPU are made up of cores, which is where the processing is actually done. And each CPU core is much faster, more powerful and more versatile than a GPU core. So why would we wanna run code on the GPU instead of the CPU? Well, the GPU has hundreds of cores where the CPU only has a handful. This means the GPU excels at doing lots of things all at once, which is incredibly handy for certain kinds of problems. The most common use for shaders is to do all the calculations involved with displaying things on the screen, and this is usually done in two stages, with a vertex shader and a fragment shader, which is sometimes called a pixel shader. We still need to run code on the CPU to use shaders though. To draw a 3D shape on the screen, the code on the CPU will pass the GPU a list of all the points or vertices that define the surface of the shape we wanna draw. The vertex shader takes these points and figures out where they should appear on the screen. And then the fragment shader figures out what color each spot on the surface of that object should be. There are other types of shaders with specific use cases as well, such as geometry and compute shaders, but they're a topic for another time. In this video, we'll take a bit of a look at the vertex shader, but we'll mostly focus on the fragment shader because for me at least, it's the most fun one to play with and also it's the most useful for the things I do in my videos. If you've ever tried doing things with individual pixels on the CPU, you know it can be pretty slow. Even on a relatively small screen, say 1280 by 720, there are nearly a million pixels that we wanna update, which takes a long time to loop through. And if you wanna try and do that 60 times a second, well, good luck. The GPU is purpose-built for these sorts of things though. Instead of doing things one after the other like the CPU, the GPU can do a whole bunch of calculations all at the same time. This is called parallel computing and it can be incredibly quick. To write programs for the GPU, we have to use a special programming language. The most common one and the one we'll be using today is called the OpenGL Shader Language or GLSL for short. The other main one is called the High Level Shader Language or HLSL and it's used by the Unity game engine. Now we know a bit of the theory of shaders, let's set up our P5 sketch to use them. Like I said at the beginning, shaders can be used in a lot of different frameworks, engines, and programs. So if you're using something other than P5, you'll wanna to get to a point where you're drawing a rectangle or a quad onto the screen, which will give our shader something to run on. And you'll also wanna figure out how to set your environment up to use a custom shader. If you don't know how to do either of these things in your environment, Google will be your best friend. And I'll join you again in the next chapter when we start writing some shaders code. To get shaders working in P5, there are a couple of things we need to do. Firstly, we need to tell the sketch to use the WebGL renderer by adding WebGL to the create canvas call in setup. This gives us access to drawing 3D shapes as well as using custom shaders. Secondly, we need to load our shader files into P5.js. P5 has a function called load shader where we can pass in the file paths for a vertex and a fragment shader and it will return a shader object. We don't have any shader files yet so we can create some by coming up here in the editor and creating two files which I'll call example.vert and example.frag for the vertex and the fragment shaders respectively. You can call yours whatever you want and the file extension doesn't matter either. I like to use .vert and .frag so I can see what type of shader is in the file at a glance, but some people like to use .glsl for all their shader files. It's up to you. 
We want to load our shader before we start running our sketch. So in the preload function, we can call load shader. In here, I'll pass in the names of the two files I've just created and I'll store the shader object that's returned in a global variable called example shader. So we've now loaded the shader into P5, but we need to tell P5 to actually use our shader. To do this in the setup function, we can call the shader function and pass in our shader object. Now everything we draw on the screen will be using our shader, which at the moment means that nothing happens because our shader files are empty. If you wanna revert back to the default shaders, the one supplied by P5, you can call the reset shader function, letting you draw normally again. For this video, we won't need to be resetting it at all, so we can set the shader to our custom shader in the setup function. Calling the shader function only sets the shader, but for the shader to actually run, we need to draw something on the screen. So let's just draw a rectangle. When we get to the vertex shader, we're gonna make this rectangle cover the whole screen, so we don't need to worry about how big it is. I'll just make mine go from zero, zero to the width and height. Two more quick things to note is that in the setup function, I'm turning off shape outlines by calling no stroke, and in the draw function, I'm calling clear to wipe the screen each frame. So now we're all done setting up our CPU code, we can take a look at some shader code. Regardless of what type of shader you're writing, there are some common things that all shaders share. All GLSL shaders have a main function, and this is the function that gets called when your shader is run. You can add other functions as you need, but this is where the shader begins. GLSL is what's called a strongly typed language, which means when you create a new variable, you have to tell the code what the type of the variable is, and you can't change it once it's set. If you've only used languages like JavaScript or Python, this might be quite new to you and it can take a bit of getting used to. In JavaScript, if you want to set a variable called x to the number 10, you can just say let x equal 10. In GLSL though, you have to say int x equals 10, which declares x to be an integer, which is a number with no decimal points. If you want to have decimal points, you'd probably want to use the float type. And just a quick note on floating points, if you don't include a decimal in a number, GLSL will assume the number is an integer, which can't be used to set a float and give you an error. So you'll see a lot of decimal points in GLSL code. Another very common data type we'll use a lot in this video is vectors, which can have two, three, or four components and can be initialized with either an individual value for each component or with a single value that will be set to all the components. The basic vector expects the components to be floats, but there are vectors available for a bunch of different types. I'll leave a link in the description that explains all the different data types available in GLSL if you want to learn more, but don't worry, I'll explain all the ones that we use in this video. You can reference the components of a vector in multiple ways. If the vector is representing position, you can use x, y, z, and w to access the four components respectively. And note if you're using, for example, a vec2, you can only access the x and y components. You can access the same four components with r, g, b, and a if it's representing a color. And there's also s, t, p, and q, which also reference the same components and apparently are the convention for texture coordinates, but I don't really use them. You can use these different representations interchangeably, which might seem confusing at first, but it can actually make things a bit clearer depending on the context that the vector is being used in. You can also access multiple components at the same time, which returns a vector of those components. This is called swizzling. For example, if you had a 3D position stored in a VEC3, but you needed a VEC2 of just the X and Y coordinates, you could get that by saying position.xy, which will return a new vector2. When swizzling, the components don't have to be in the regular order either. If you had a VEC4 representing a color and you wanted to swap the red and blue channels, you could do that by saying color.bgra, which returns a new VEC4 with the red and blue switched. You can also use swizzling to create larger vectors than the one you started with. I can't think of a good example scenario, but it does come up from time to time. If you had, say, a 2D position vector and wanted to turn that into a VEC4, you could do something like position.xyxx to quickly create it. Once you get your head around it, swizzling is incredibly useful and we'll use it later in this video. As well as the variables you create inside your shader, there are also variables that are passed into it by the program running on the CPU, in my case a P5.js sketch. These are labeled as either attributes or uniforms. Attributes are only available in the vertex shader and hold information that can vary per vertex, such as the vertex position and color. Uniforms will stay constant each time your shader is run and are available in both the vertex and fragment shader. Attributes and uniforms are read-only, so they can't be changed from inside your shader. There are also varying variables, and these are variables that are set in the vertex shader and are then passed as read-only variables into the fragment shader. This is how, for example, the coordinate of a texture gets passed from the vertex to the fragment shader. For the most part, these variables will get set by the environment you're writing the shader for. There's a link in the description that details all the attributes and uniforms that P5 sets for us. 
If you're not using P5.js, there'll probably be a similar page in your platform's documentation so you can figure out what's available to you. You'll get to see all of these in action when we're writing our code, which is coming up next, but just quickly, there's one last thing to be aware of. A lot of values in shaders are normalized, which means that they'll be in the range of zero to one. As an example, we usually think of color as going from zero to 255. So if you wanted white, you'd put 255 in each color channel, but in a shader, white would have all ones. Now we've got a grasp on the basics of GLSL, let's write some actual shader code. In order to see anything on the screen, we need a fragment shader and a vertex shader. So to get started, we're gonna create a very, very basic fragment shader. All it's gonna do is let us see some shapes on the screen when we start writing the vertex shader, but we'll come back and revisit the fragment shader in a lot more depth later on. For now though, in the fragment shader, I've just got a main function which sets the GL frag color, which is the variable holding the output color of the shader, to be a vec4 of all ones. Just like we talked about earlier, a vector of all ones gives us the color white, so every pixel that gets run through this shader will become white. So now we've got the absolute bare bones of a fragment shader, but in order to see anything, we need a vertex shader. So let's take a look at that. For the types of things I usually do with shaders, the vertex shader doesn't play a big role. It's more of a stepping stone for me on the way to the fragment shader. I find that I reuse the same vertex shader just about every time. This is the entirety of the vertex shader that I usually use. I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail in what the vertex shader can do because we wanna focus on the fragment shader, but I will break down what's going on here. Just like the fragment shader, the vertex shader also has a main function. And just like how we set the GL frag color in the fragment shader, you can see a variable called GL position getting set. This is the output of the vertex shader and it holds the position of the vertex we're currently calculating. As I mentioned earlier, there are variables called attributes, which are only available in the vertex shader, which you can see at the top of the shader. In this case, you can see a vec3 called a position, which holds the world space position of the vertex, and a vec2 called a text coord, which holds the coordinate we would use in the fragment shader if we want to draw a texture on the face of the geometry we're rendering. These attributes are values that are automatically set in the shader by P5 when we draw shapes on the screen. And if you remember in our case, we're drawing a rectangle, so the corner vertices are getting set. If you're not using P5, you should be able to find similar attributes set by the environment you're in. I've also got a varying variable called pos, and this will get passed into our fragment shader. We want it to hold the pixel coordinate, so for now we can just set it to our A text coord. We'll discuss this a bit more when we get back to the fragment shader. For the GL position, we're taking the original vertex positions, which are in the zero to one range and remapping them to be in the negative one to one range, which is the expected range for visible vertices. And this makes our rectangle take up the entire screen. And you can see when we use this vertex shader in combination with our basic fragment shader, we get a fully white screen, even though nowhere in our CPU code do we say to make the screen white. This means that our first shader program is up and running. If we don't remap the vertex position, you can see we only get our shader running in the top right quadrant of the screen, which is not what we want, which is why we have to remap it. For our use case, the vertex calculations are pretty straightforward, but if you want your rectangle or any other geometry to respect the coordinates that you give it, instead of just taking up the whole screen, you'll have to convert the vertex coordinates from world space to screen space, which is where you start getting into transformation matrices. To do this in P5, you would multiply the vertex position by the projection and model view matrices, which are attributes passed in by P5. How these matrices work is a bit out of the scope of this video, but I just thought you should be aware that by not using them, we make our rectangle take up the full screen, which is what we want since we're going to focus on the output of the fragment shader. Before we move on from the vertex shader though, I'll quickly show you how we can affect the position of the vertices with the shader. To make this a bit more obvious, instead of drawing a rectangle on the screen, I'll instead draw an ellipse. This should make it clear that the fragment shader only gets run for the pixels that fall inside the area defined by the vertices that get passed in. By default, an ellipse drawn by P5 in WebGL mode doesn't have many vertices, so it looks a bit chunky, but we can change that by passing in a fifth argument into the ellipse function to increase the detail. I'll set this to 150, so we've got more vertices to play with. Now we can mess around with the vertex positions inside the vertex shader. For example, I could offset the Y position by 0.1, which moves our circle up, even though from the CPU, we're still drawing the circle at the same location. We can also try offsetting the Y position by the X position, which gives our circle a slant, or we can use the X position in the sine function to give our circle some waves. We can even pass in a time variable and use that to animate the waves. I'm glossing over some stuff here, but don't worry, I'll go into detail about how to pass in variables and all that sort of stuff when we look at the fragment shader again, which we're about to do. 
If you want to see how I'm manipulating these vertices in more detail, you'll find a link to this sketch in the description called Vertex Shader Example. There you can see everything we've talked about so far and play around with it and run this code in your browser. So we're back in the fragment shader now and I've gotten rid of the ellipse and returned to drawing a rectangle and I've removed the bits from the vertex shader that make it all wiggly. So we're back to just having a white screen. The color that we're outputting is a VEC4 of all ones, but we can expand the VEC4 constructor to set each channel individually. So for example, I could set the second parameter, the green value to zero and leave the rest as ones which will turn our screen magenta. So by changing the values of the output vector, we can make the screen whatever color we want. But this is a lot of work to just make the screen a single color. So let's try making some gradients instead. If you remember in the vertex shader, we created a varying variable called pos and we set it to the texture pixel position. We can read this value in the fragment shader and use it to change the color depending on where we are on the screen. To do this, we can add a varying declaration at the top of the fragment shader that matches the one in the vertex shader. Just like the color values, the position variable is also normalized to be in the range of zero to one. So we can pass the position X directly into one of our color channels, for example, the red channel. This gives us a gradient from blue to pink. The left hand side is blue since that's where the X coordinate is zero, removing all the red. Then as we move right, X increases up to one, giving us a pink color. We're not limited to just using the X position either, of course. Let's try making a 2D gradient by using both the X and Y values of the position in the red and green channels. Since the position is a VEC2, we can use it directly as the first two arguments in the VEC4 constructor, taking care of the red and green channels. So we only need to pass in floats for the blue and alpha channel, giving us a lovely 2D gradient. Since the red increases as we move right through the image and the green increases as we move up, we know that the origin is in the bottom left of the screen. Before we continue exploring gradients, I want to explain something that I said we'd come back to. If you remember, the position variable we're using is passed in from the vertex shader and we're using the texture coordinate. But there's another way to get the position of the current pixel. Fragment shaders have a global variable called glfragcoord, but it differs from our position variable in a few ways. Firstly, instead of holding a normalized value between zero and one, it gives us the values in pixel coordinates. So if you wanna use it the same way we're using the pos vector, you'll have to divide it by the screen size to get it in the zero to one range. The screen size isn't readily available either, so you'd have to pass those values into the shader. And secondly, the position is given relative to the whole screen. For us, this doesn't make much of a difference because in the vertex shader, we make our quad take up the whole screen. But if you're drawing on a surface that doesn't take up the full screen, that's when you'll start noticing the difference. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here since like I said, it's a bit irrelevant for us, but basically the texture position will range from zero to one over the region we're drawing in. Whereas the GL frag coord, when divided by the screen size, ranges from zero to one over the entire screen. So we'll lose some values in the region where we're drawing to. If you're rendering 3D geometry, you'll have to be careful as well. This sphere is using the texture coordinates for the gradient and it looks fine, but if we rotate it around, there's a big seam where the texture wraps around. If we use the GL frag coord though, you can see that rotating the sphere does nothing because the pixels are always in the same position. Again, this won't affect us since we're just drawing on a rectangle, but it's just something to keep in mind if you're trying to achieve something other than using the fragment shader to render to the entire screen. If you're curious, there's a link in the description called Fragment Shader Position Example where you can take a closer look. Okay, tangent over, let's get back to the gradients. In our gradients so far, we've been using the position value directly as a color channel in the output color, which works well, but it limits our color choices. Fortunately, GLSL has a function called mix, which makes it really easy for us to create a gradient between any colors we want. The mix function uses linear interpolation to smoothly transition between two values. And to see this in action, we can create two VEC4s holding the colors we want for our gradient. We'll use these as the first two parameters in the mix function. And for the last parameter, we'll use our position's X coordinate. This third parameter controls where in the transition between colors we are. When the last parameter's value is zero, the output will match our first color. And when it's a one, it'll output the second color. If the value is between zero and one, the output is a proportional mix of the two colors. Using the mix function, we're able to create a simple 1D gradient just like before, but we've got much easier control over the colors we're using. We can also create 2D gradients using the mix function as well. For this, we'll need four colors, one for each corner. Since the mix function can only handle two values at a time, we have to create our gradient in stages. First, we'll use the X position to create two new colors called bottom and top. And we'll use the two bottom colors and the two top colors respectively. 
We can then get the final output by mixing between the bottom and top colors using the Y position as the transition value. This gives us a 2D gradient with easily customizable corner colors. The mix function is really versatile and we're not limited to just using VEC4s like I've shown here. If you want to find out more, there's a link to the documentation for the mix function in the description. For the sake of keeping our shaders simple, as we continue, I'm going to go back to using the position directly in our output color. But as you've seen, the mix function is incredibly useful, so I had to show you how to use it. As well as using the position directly, we can also manipulate the position variable before we output it as a color. Let's create a new VEC2 called new pos and use that as our color output. We'll set new pos equal to the value of our current position, but run through the fract function, which does nothing. What the fract function does is return the decimal part of a number. Our position is between zero and one, so it's already only decimals, which is why nothing changes. But what we can do is multiply our position by a number, say 10, and suddenly we can see our gradient is copied 10 times in both directions. Using the fract function like this can be really useful if you want to repeat something in your fragment shader. As another example of playing with a position before outputting it, let's go back to the linear gradient we had before using the X position in the red channel. But let's use the sign function on the X position and pass that in instead. You'll notice when we do this, there's a lot more blue in the output than pink. And this is because the output of the sign function goes between negative one and one, but colors go between zero and one. So a negative value will just get clamped to zero. Likewise, a number greater than one will just get clamped to one. We can even out the colors by remapping the sign value to be between zero and one. Like I mentioned in the vertex shader section, we can pass in a time variable and use that to animate the sign function. To do this, we'll add the declaration of a uniform float called millis at the top of our shader, which we'll pass in the elapsed milliseconds into. How you set the uniforms will again depend on the platform you're using, but if you're using P5 like me, you can use the set uniform function. If we go into our JavaScript, we want to update the millis every time we draw with the shader. So in the draw function, just before we draw our rectangle onto the screen, we can call the set uniform function on our shader object and pass in two parameters. The first is a string with the name of the uniform we're setting. This has to match whatever's in your shader. So we'll put in millis here. And the second parameter is the value that we want to set. P5 has its own millis function built in that returns the number of milliseconds our sketch has been running. So we can just call that and pass the value in directly. If we go back into the fragment shader, in the sign function, we can now add the millis value to the position.x, which will make the result scroll really quickly over time. To slow down the scrolling speed, we can divide the millis by a thousand, which converts it into seconds and slows the animation down. In the description, you'll find another link labeled fragment shader gradient examples, which has the code for what we've been doing in the fragment shader so far. And again, you can edit the code and run it in your browser. We can of course pass things other than just numbers into our shaders as well. So for example, we could pass in an image. Let's add another uniform variable. This time its type will be sampler2d, which is the type we need for textures and we'll call it background. And of course we need to set this uniform as well. In our P5 sketch, we can use the load image method in the preload function to load an image and store it in a variable, which I've called background image. And just like we did with the millis uniform, we can call set uniform on the shader object. We'll pass in the name, background and the background image variable, which will make the image available to use in the shader. We can do this in the setup function since unlike the millis uniform, we don't need it to update every frame. Back in the fragment shader, we want to be able to get the color of the image at our location and draw that onto the screen. To do this, we can use the texture2d function, which takes two parameters. First, the sampler2d of the image that we want to read, and secondly, a vec2 of the normalized position. This is another instance where our values should be between zero and one, and thankfully our fragment's pos vector is already normalized, so we can pass that straight in. The texture2d function returns a vec4 holding the color of the image at the current location, so we can store that in a color variable, then set the GL frag to it, which draws the image onto the screen. But you'll notice that our image is upside down, or more accurately, it's flipped. To fix this, we can create a new VEC2, which we'll call new pos and set it to the position vector. We can then flip the image back by setting the new pos.y to one minus the current Y position. And now you'll see the image is displaying the right way up. We're again being a bit boring in how we use the position values to fetch the data from the texture, but like we did with the gradients, you should try playing around with the position vector before you pass it into the texture2d function to see how you can warp the image. 
Now that we're reading from images, you can start doing some effects on them. A very simple example is to make images grayscale. We can do this by setting the R, G and B values of the output to the average of the three channels we read from the image. To get the average, we can simply add up the red, green and blue and divide by three since there are three values. And we can store this in a float called average and use that in our color output. You know the drill by now, there's a link in the description for these examples called fragment shader image examples. If doing this sort of image processing interests you, you should check out my last video where I took a look at the p5.filter shader library that makes applying image processing shaders to your p5 sketches really easy. There's a link in the description to the GitHub for that library if you're interested. If you want to set a uniform to an array, there's a little quirk that you need to be aware of, but before we try setting arrays, let's look at just setting a vector uniform. I've stripped all of the image stuff back out of the fragment shader so we've got a clean slate. Hopefully you're getting comfortable with passing in uniforms because we're about to add another one, this time a VEC3 called color. We can use this color vector directly in the output and now whatever values we set from our sketch will be the output of our shader. To set this from the JavaScript side, it can be tempting to use a vector object, but in P5 at least, we can't do that. Instead, we have to pass in an array with as many values as our vector has, in this case, three. In the setup, I'm gonna set the uniform to be an array of 101, which gives us the color magenta. Now let's try to pass in an array of VEC3s instead of just a single vector. We can update our uniform to be an array and we'll change the name to colors. In GLSL, you have to specify how long your array will be. So we'll pass in two colors so we can specify that in the square brackets here. I'll also quickly update the value we're outputting to use the first color in our array, which is at index zero. In the JavaScript, I'll create a second array, just like the first one, but set to cyan. We can then create another array that has these two color arrays inside it, creating our array of vector values, and we can set the uniform. When we do this, our screen is completely black, which is not what we'd expect. And this is the quirk I was talking about. Even though we said in the shader that the uniform is an array of VEC3s, you have to set it as a single long array of values, in this case floats, and the shader will group it into clumps of threes for each vector. So to fix this in the JavaScript, we wanna make our color array hold all six values like this. Doing this, we get the magenta on the screen just like before, and if we change the shader to output the second color, we get cyan. Perfect. And just like before, there's a fragment shader array example linked in the description. If you've gotten this far, well done. We're getting pretty close to the end now. What we're gonna do now is look at a technique for drawing shapes called sine distance functions or SDFs. It's a bit of a more advanced technique, but I'm gonna keep it simple in this video and you can explore it further. I'll link some resources in the description if you're interested. This technique can be used to draw all kinds of shapes in 2D and 3D, and it's how people can make full 3D scenes with ray marching all done entirely in a shader. We're gonna barely scratch the surface by just drawing some circles on the screen. All an SDF is, is a function that returns how far a point is from the surface of some shape. The value will be greater than zero if the point is outside the shape, and it'll be less than zero if it's inside the shape. The value will be zero if it's exactly on the edge. And this is why it's called a signed distance function. A circle is a nice and easy SDF to calculate, and all we need to know is the center position and a radius of a circle. Let's define a VEC3 called circle and we'll set both the X and Y to be 0.5, giving a location of the center of the screen and set the Z to 0.3, defining a radius. To calculate the SDF, we first have to find the distance between our current position and the center of the circle. We can do this by subtracting the circle center from our position and calling the length function to get the distance of the resulting vector. We have to use swizzling here to reduce our circle vector to just the X and Y components, because remember the Z component is the radius of our circle. We're storing this distance in a float called D, and this distance is to the center of the circle, but we need the distance to the edge instead. To fix this, we simply subtract the radius from the distance, and this remaps the distance so that anything closer to the center than the radius gives a negative number, and anything further away is positive, which is an SDF. We can display the circle by displaying the distance in the R, G, and B channels. We can see that the outline is a gradient, and this is because the SDF is a continuous value that increases the further away you get from the surface. To make the circle sharp, we need to figure out if we're inside the circle or not, which with an SDF just means we check if we're less than zero. An efficient way to do this is to use the step function. The step function will return zero if the second parameter is less than the first parameter and otherwise returns a one. The first parameter is known as the edge. So we can set D to the output of the step function with an edge of zero and the distance as the second parameter, giving us a nice sharp circle. 
When the distance is less than zero, the step function returns zero, which makes the output black. And if it's greater than zero, meaning we're outside the circle, then the step function returns one, making the output white. If this circle's too sharp, there's also a smooth step function, which is very similar to the step function. The difference being it takes two edges instead of just one. Like before, if the last parameter is less than the first edge, it returns zero. And if it's greater than or equal to the second edge, it returns one. If, however, the last parameter is between the two edges, we get a smooth gradient between zero and one. And this lets us soften the edge of our circle. Let's bring back our uniform vec3 array from earlier, but instead of using them to define colors, let's use the values to define circles. I've also got a constant integer called numCircles, which I've set to be 100, and you can see I use this to define the size of the circles array. We can get rid of the circle we defined and instead wrap our SDF in a for loop that goes from zero up to the number of circles we have. We'll also define a float called color above the for loop and set it to one. This will keep track of whether the current position is inside any circle or not and determine the final color. Inside the for loop, we can update the SDF calculation to use the circles from the array. And once we've finished calculating D, we can use it to multiply the color variable. Since anything times zero is zero, as soon as we're inside a circle, the color will become black. And if we're not inside any circle, the color will remain white. Back in the JavaScript, I've created a matching const called numCircles, which is also set to 100. And using what we learned before about setting array uniforms, I create a circles array in the setup function and loop through the number of circles we have, adding a random x and y location, as well as a random radius each time, creating a single long array of all the vector values. Finally, I set the circles uniform, and when we run this, we can see our random circles being drawn on the screen. And every time we rerun the sketch, we get new random circles. Circles are absolutely the simplest SDF, but I've left a link in the description to an article that details a whole bunch of SDFs that you can use, and I'd really encourage you to try playing around with them. The guy that wrote this article is an absolute shade of God, and I would highly encourage you to check out the rest of his website, as well as his YouTube channel, which I've also linked in the description. And just like before, there's a link in the description as well for this code labeled fragment shader SDF example. You'll notice when we're figuring out if our position was inside a circle, we used a step function to return numbers instead of using an if statement and booleans. This is because generally speaking, it's best to avoid branching code in shaders. Because the GPU is trying to run hundreds of copies of the same shader code all at the same time, it works best if they're all taking the same code paths. So if you're using if statements and your shader is running slowly, try using some maths instead. This can absolutely take a bit of getting used to, but you can usually do all the logic operations that you need to using floats. As you saw, we can use the step function like an if statement. A little bit harder to catch would have been how we used multiplication like an and statement. The color float started as one, which is like being true, and we want it to remain true if we're outside all of the circles. The D value is one or true if we're outside any given circle and zero or false if we're inside it. By multiplying the color variable by D, we're essentially accumulating and expressions. As soon as we're inside a single circle, it's set to zero, which is false, and it'll remain that way. Here's a truth table for the multiplication of ones and zeros, which is the exact same as a logical and. A similar thing can be done using addition in combination with the step function as an or operation. And you can use one minus a value as a not operation. Again, like a lot of shader programming, this takes a bit of getting used to, but you'll get the hang of it and your shaders will run even faster because of it. It can be useful to first create the shader with just normal logic and if statements and then convert it to maths afterwards. There's another link for this example called fragment shader logic example in the description. I'm not gonna lie though, it's a bit of a boring one. There's one last thing to quickly mention before we finish up and that is debugging shader code can be pretty difficult. There's no way to hook up the GPU to a debugger and there's no print function to spam variables into the console. The only real output is the vertex positions in the case of the vertex shader and pixel colors in the fragment shader. So often what you'll end up having to do is output the values you're debugging as colors and try and interpret them. This is also not as straightforward as it might seem because if you remember, colors can only be between zero and one. So you might have to scale the value before outputting it. You'll get a lot better at reading colors as you go, but when you're just starting out, it's probably best to just use a single color channel at a time so it's not too confusing. Once you get better at it, you'll start feeling like a witch or wizard trying to interpret tea leaves and it's no wonder that people think shaders are black magic.
And there you go, you made it. That was a pretty comprehensive introduction to shaders. Hopefully you're feeling a bit more comfortable with them now. There's a lot of information in this video, so it might take a few watches before everything sinks in. But if you keep practicing, it'll become second nature in no time. You're probably sick of hearing it by now, but one last time, there are links for everything I've mentioned, as well as all the examples in the description. And again, if you have any questions, please just ask them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. If you're somehow thirsty for even more shader stuff after this behemoth of a video, there's another one of my shader videos that you can watch here. Thank you so much for watching, happy coding, and I hope to see you again soon.